businesses look to us for specialist insurance solutions. Do you? Over 80 of the top 100 JSE listed companies trust us to protect their businesses. Good day and welcome to the Role of Insurance series with myself, Fifi Peters. This is a series that places the uh, microscope on the different sectors within the insurance space and the external factors that are influencing insurance risks. We are living in an era of unprecedented change and today we face risks that did not exist a decade ago, including the challenges brought by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the subsequent rapid adoption of technology. The shift to remote work has accelerated the adoption of platforms and devices that allow more transfers of sensitive data with third parties. However, these same capabilities have also exposed users to elevated forms of digital and cyber risk. And so today's episode, we will look at the increasing cyber threat in a di digital age and the impact on SMEs. And joining me to uh, take the discussion uh, further are Philippa Wild, the head of of commercial underwriting at Santam, Alicia Naransami, the underwriting head, uh, digital distribution at SHA, and Adrian Chester, manager of commercial casualty underwriting at Santam. Uh, good day to all of you, Philippa. I would like to begin with you. So just looking at the uh, risk environment right now uh, for business and everything that is a potential threat, right? From uh, political risk to weather-related risk and even uh, risks that still stay with us uh, from the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Where does a cyber risk fit into that uh, pecking order? How high does it rank for businesses? It, it ranks high in the top three or four, and it's actually increasing as, as it goes along. With the um, you know, break of COVID and the fact that people are working from home and the connectivity that you talked about earlier, this is one of the areas where companies are really exposed. All companies in today's age rely on technology, rely on data, rely on systems and services to enable them to deliver to their clients. Um, and being able to, to, to operate on a daily 24-7 basis and be able to give your clients the correct level of service, you need access to all your data and systems uh, and things that you have. And if a cyber attack comes in and uh, impacts your ability to deliver, it can be quite serious. So this is quite a, quite a significant risk for companies. Mm -hmm. And in a, a South Africa perspective, can you give us the numbers in terms of the uh, potential size of the industry, as you did allude to the fact that it was one that was growing and growing quite fast? Yes, absolutely. According to a study done by Accenture, um, the number of cases in South Africa is about the third largest in the world, um, just in terms of activity, in terms of cyber, cyber events. Um, it's estimated to cost the co economy currently about 2.2 billion. Um, at the moment, a lot of companies are not disclosing it, but with the advent of Poppia and the various regulations, we are required to start disclosing it. So it is definitely rising and it is quite significant. A lot of, a lot of entities and individuals think it won't happen to me, but it's really out there and it's becoming more and more known and in the public domain. Right. Until it's too late and until it does happen uh, to me. But Alicia, can I ask you to come in here right now? And just, I mean, uh, as Philip alluded to, the, the numbers in terms of the monies is, it's, it's is large. It's a billion rand industry, as it were. But in a South African uh, context, can you give us uh, the areas and the ways in which most South African companies are targeted with cybercrime? Absolutely, Vivi. Um, so we're seeing a wide range of cybercrime activity, right? So alongside the SMA, SA market, from malware to ransomware, phishing, as well as theft of funds. And it really is indiscriminate attacks across the finance, the legal industry, even the IT industry is a target. Um, in the SA market as a whole, we note that hacking and ransomware are dominant attacks. That being said, 40% of businesses are being attacked. 40% um, of that is attributed to data exposure. And ransomware attacks are most definitely on the uptick Fifi, in the past 12 to 18 months alone, with 24% of South African companies being hit by ransomware attacks alone. 
And what are the main forms of entry, uh, Alicia? How, how do these cyber criminals do it? Yeah, so there's basically, and what I always attribute to, the person that sits in between the desk and the chair is your weakest link, right? So what we're also seeing is the rise in phishing attempts. Um, we also find this across the legal industry, across the finance industry as well, um, where hackers are sort of impersonating CEOs, etc., to try and reel, you know, PAs, etc., or the accountants to pay funds into the hackers' accounts, and then just exploitation of the system by clicking on malicious links that will take the employee or you know the staff into unauthorized territory, links that they sh really shouldn't be clicking on. All of that creates this hotbed of cyber crime activity. And so, Adrian, if uh, a cyber crime is a, a growing uh, threat, it is keeping uh, quite a number of uh, business uh, people awake at night. It is a, a big risk to operations going forward. How then is the insurance industry uh, responding to this risk? Well, what we've done is designed a policy product that can meet the various needs of the clients. And one of the, the main concerns is the risk of a data breach exposure. That can be from phishing attempts, ransomware attacks, identity theft, corporate esp espionage, activism, theft of funds. All of these can be catered for in a cyber insurance policy. And we can transfer that risk to insurers. Mm -hmm. Uh, just can you flesh out uh, a bit more the, uh, the level of, uh, of coverage, exactly what are we being covered for and exactly what is excluded from the uh, coverage offering? Our policy is broken up into three elements, which we perhaps first party and third party. And so we want to cover your own loss of data if your records are compromised under your first party, but as well as if a third party holds you liable for the loss of their records. But key to this whole insurance policy uh, policy is that we have the pre-loss mitigation factors where we ensure that the client's frequency and severity of loss is greatly reduced by having a risk management solution. Also post-loss, we make sure that the client's risk is mitigated to get that business established as quickly as possible and they turn over back to what it was prior to the loss. And those are some of the key fundamentals in the policy that we address the client's needs to ensure okay. business continuity. All right, all right. Alicia, just uh, your uh, take, uh, perhaps from an SHA uh, perspective in terms of the level of, of coverage, the product offerings that are out there for businesses, particularly small businesses, to uh, protect themselves uh, uh, from that risk. If you could just expand on that further. So as Adrian alluded to, the, comp the policy really you know, makes up four of your quadrants which is your business interruption, your data breach, which is, which is your core cover. So that's the main cover element, your data breach subsequent to that cybercrime and extortion and third party um, loss as well. And really the coverage in itself is very modular in design. What I mean by that, PP is as long as you take the main cover element being data breach out, the price is really fit to sort of toggle between the other elements of cover, making it really affordable for the SME markets. And what we also found, which was interesting, and Adrian did touch on it, is the risk management services. So our data actually indicates that most SMEs don't have the basic cybersecurity protocols in place, right? That being for one antivirus. So what we did there was package that antivirus solution and ongoing monitoring to change the awareness um, and to really take the business on a journey in uplifting their cybersecurity posture. So all of those covers are structured in the cyber SME, which is what we call it policy, to offer the client just not only a policy that extends from an insurance perspective, but beyond that to create the right awareness that SMEs require. Uh, Philippa, I mean, uh, an SME looking at this uh, discussion and just uh, wondering uh, specifics in terms of the uh, type of uh, cover uh, to choose from and how they uh, reason, how they make that uh, decision around which cover I should take and how to ensure that the cover that I do take on board uh, pays me and pays me out uh, properly when it is time for, for claims. I mean, what would you say, what would you say to those businesses? Yeah, so firstly, it's very important to understand 
yourself are you exposed to risk what kind of exposure do you have and and do i need cover and how well am i protected so as my colleagues have mentioned um the risk management is critical and key uh the, the big thing in this space is, is is seeking the help of a financial advisor as well to help explain these things to you it's very important that you understand what your product offers you and what the product does not offer you as as well as your your own risk management ability and that's actually one of the nice features of the product is that we enable the client to to assess what level of security they currently have and help them enhance that. Um, in, in stats, we've seen that you know 40% of, of companies just purchase free, free uh, software, um, antivirus software off, off, off the web, which is fine, but there could be better options or solutions in that space. Um, and uh, about a third of companies don't even back up their data in the SME space. So it's about understanding everything, making sure you, you understand your risks, how to risk manage, and then I would say definitely uh, get the assistance of an advanced financial advisor to, to help in, in understanding your product. For sure. But just if we uh, reflect on the uh, landscape, the SME landscape as it currently stands here in South Africa, Philippa, would you say that there is a an adequate awareness amongst a small to medium enterprises in this country about the growing risk that is cybercrime to their organizations? I think it's increasing and it's doing better um, in terms of that, of, of raising the awareness. A lot of education is happening in this space um, and a lot of articles in the media and so forth. So it is becoming better. But no, it's not where it should be. Um, you know, when you speak to financial advisors in the insurance industry and you speak to your, your commercial larger um, uh, entities, it's quite clear that they understand the risks and they rank it in the top three or four um, of their potential exposures as businesses. But in the small and, and medium enterprise space, there's a lot more education that needs to happen, um, especially in the entrepreneurial space where companies are just trying to survive and run their day-to-day -day activities. It's not always risk management, from, especially from a cyber perspective, is not always top of mind. Mm -hmm. What is the, or what are some of the factors that perhaps then, uh, Alicia, in your view, that are holding back some small businesses from taking this uh, level of, of coverage. I don't know if maybe you can uh, speak to the level of uptake that you have seen, particularly throughout the pandemic, where uh, I think we got a whole lot of uh, cyber risk incidences being reported as there was this huge migration into the digital and the huge adoption on digitizing business services. Uh, what is the present level of, of, of uptake and what is holding back those who are not yet on board uh, what is holding them back? Yeah, I'll talk to what is holding them back first before I go to the level of uptake, if that's okay. Um, because interestingly enough, Fifi, our SHA annual risk data reveals that 64% of SMEs believe they are not targets. So again, going back to that awareness thing element, right? Additionally, they believe that what would a hacker want with an SME of my size and nature? Let's talk about that in the context of ransomware for a second. Almost 54% of businesses of SMEs who were hit with, with ransomware paid the ransom. Why? Because they probably didn't have the potential cybersecurity protocols in place leading to backups, right? So from there, once again, you know, head stuck in the sand, it'll never happen to me, so I don't need the cover. They end up paying the ransomware and they're hit a second time around. So that notion that it'll never happen to me really needs to fall away um, in order, you know, to, to advertly um, acquire the right um, mindset and cybersecurity risk as well. Looking at the uptick for the insurance side on our side, when we launched about two years ago, we saw phenomenal uptick because we packaged it with the risk management service, which really catered for a lot of the SMEs there. So we're looking at about 34% hit ratio on um, the, the uptick for insurance quarter on quarter, which is significantly good. Um, recently, we will be launching the product within the Santam environment, and we're looking to see that uptick increase further and further as well. So really from the SME side, I really employ SMEs to not solely think that it'll never happen to me, because that's a notion that should never be adopted, and to actually seek the right insurance cover to enable them to keep their businesses sustained, really. Sure. Just beyond the uh, risks of having your data compromised and also uh, beyond the fact that uh, a business in the event in which you are attacked, you, are, you may have to pay a ransom. 
Adrian, I'd like to find out from you what the other risks are that are associated with being hit by a cyber attack for small businesses. Well, what, once you've had the data breach itself, the, the business is exposed to a drop in turnover, which results in an extreme loss in net profit. And so that business interruption element is the consequential loss of being hacked. There's also the loss of the business reputation that we need to protect to make sure that the business can go on. And we, within our policy, cater for reputational management of the insured so that the right messages and media and marketing is gone out, as well as this right correct security protocols. We even have benefits to include identity theft monitoring and credit monitoring for any affected customers so that they too don't suffer a loss as well and can protect them in that way. I'm just wondering what you advise clients who uh, do find themselves in a compromised position in which they are hit and they are asked to uh, pay a ransom. From an insurance perspective, insurance policy perspective, what is the uh, advice there? Does, does one pay or should they call you before they engage in such conversations? They should absolutely contact us first on. We have a designated team and a manned call center for 24 hour seven response with IT professionals, white ethical hackers, IT specialists to identify if a breach has taken place, as well as the steps to remediate the, bas the business and to restore the business to what it was prior to the breach incident. With these forensic experts can also identify what data was taken, if anything, because sometimes these data thefts are actually eluded. They know take place and the insured is not really, is led to believe that a hack had taken place when none had taken place at all. And so we manage those steps using specialists who monitor our call centers on a 24-7 basis. Mm -hmm. And at what, at what cost, just relative to what you are uh, uh, offering out there? I mean, uh, for those who have the perception that perhaps it's, it's unaffordable or it's too expensive, can you perhaps uh, clarify that, that thought? Absolutely. We, we've targeted SMEs and created a, a pricing solution that's relative to their market. Of course, it depends on the nature of your business activity and the limits of indemnities that you choose, but well, refor well affordable and within the means of SMEs from a couple hundred rands to the, the lower thousands for the higher limits of indemnity to, for them to transfer that risk of a SAVI event and get those pre and post loss risk mitigation factors on board so that we can keep these small businesses going forward in the future should they have a cyber breach. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Philippa, I imagine that uh, quite an important uh, job uh, for the uh, brokers in the industry is to make sure that they're able to sell this product uh, in a way that uh, many businesses understand perhaps a few complexities that they may perceive there to be. Uh, can you just talk to uh, me about the, uh, uh, the brokers, how they have pulled up their socks in these past two years where cyber incidences have become more of a norm? Is there a, a level of thorough understanding and confidence amongst them uh, regarding the uh, products uh, in, 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 in the cyberspace that they are selling? Yeah, so I think that's definitely improving as we're going along. I mean, you get specialist brokers who focus on specific um, areas, uh, and one of them could be would be the cyberspace. What's very important for us, as we're educating the clients and the market out there is also education of the broker and the financial advisor to help and assist them with that. There's, there's a lot of material available that insurance companies generally provide for their financial advisors. Um, and there's obviously a lot of information in the media as well as mentioned previously. So we provide the tools and the abilities for, for brokers to do our courses and upskill themselves so that they are well positioned to give the correct advice and enable or help, help their clients purchase appropriate cover for cyber insurance. So it sounds like you are saying that there's uh, quite a, a strong level of collaboration that is involved in tackling this head on. Absolutely, across the industry. I mean, for, for us, where we sit as an insurance company, we always want to provide the best cover that we can to our clients. We're proactively looking for risks that need to be insured where clients need help. Um, and you know, a large part of what we do is making sure that clients know what they purchased as explained. And with, you know, the financial advisors are key. So we need to make sure that they're also um, upskilled and have all the, the available information at their, at their fingertips to help the clients. All right. What about the level of uh, policy uh, standardization? Alicia, to invite you back in to comment on this, how would you uh, describe the uh, level of uh, 
terms used across policies, the degree of difference or perhaps even complexity that this difference uh, does introduce into understanding the ins and outs of the policy? That is such a great question, PP. I mean, we're dealing with the SME market, right? They are PPR rules that one must comply with, which speaks to just what you said, the language and the tonality of the policy and the covers. So in saying so, when we embarked on this journey, we were very mindful to ensure that we keep the policy in plain and simple language. However, insofar as the covers are concerned, there are many cyber policies out there. Ones that sort of offer your third party a loan cover, ones that really offer post loss cover type policies as well. And this brings in that concern, especially when onboarding a client. The inception process must be clear, must be concise, and clients must really understand what they are agreeing or answering to. And what I really mean by that, for example, is some post loss policies allow for the client to simply tick here that you have firewalls, antivirus patching, et cetera. And the client and the broker who's probably in a rush will agree to everything. And the issue emanates at claim stage when the client actually doesn't have X, Y, Z in place and the policy would not pay out. So here I would caution brokers and clients to ensure that the step in the underwriting process is answered to just avoid ambiguity and unnecessary exposure when dealing with different elements of um, cyber insurance policies in the market. But is there a move uh, or is there a will to perhaps standardize those uh, elements in the industry a bit more, perhaps move towards an industry-wide uh, approach in your view? So we are getting there, we're not there yet. Like I said, each sort of insurer has their own quadrants, their own covers, their own cover elements as well. Um, at the core though, it is those four main cover elements. Um, some descriptions might differ here or there, but there is a push and a drive to ensure uniformity across um, the industry. So if we're saying and we're making the argument that uh, cyber crime and cyber attacks are going to be uh, more and more important in the order of doing business, Adrian, I'd like to understand from your point of view how you think businesses, particularly small businesses, uh, should be moving forward in adapting to this risk. So I think awareness is key and the, the integral part that insurance plays together with risk management services is, is the main way that we can fight this, the scourge of cyber attacks. We need to ensure that all our staff within the, in the organization is aware of cyber risks and how to manage and prevent an a, attack from taking place. So historically, one would seek cyber cover to protect only your losses, but now there's an active push to include risk management services to protect your business, as well as your customer's data who you're holding on your system. And collaboratively, we can then fight this and prevent cyber risks from happening. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, uh, we are shopping a whole lot more uh, from home right now. Uh, many people are still adopting the work from home uh, method and methodology as uh, those who return to the office uh, say that they'll do so in a hybrid uh, form. So there'll still be that element of uh, data sharing from uh, different, different locations. Adrian, what then in terms of tips can you share for not only consumers, but also uh, businesses to ensure that they are less vulnerable in this new norm? So other than awareness of staff as to the exposure of cyber risks, is to ensure that your software is up to date. You have the correct right patch management systems in place and you actively install the updates on your systems. All right. Alicia? Yeah, sure, I can come in there, Adrian. Um, what we've seen a lot of is data that is exposed, that's out there. If we look at the headlines, a lot of com corporate companies have been hacked and the data is exposed. So Fifi, my tip here would be, when you get an email to say that your data has been exposed, please change your password, please do. The reason I say this is because the culmination of hacks that have emanated across the South African market leaves individuals like myself and yourself exposed, i.e., your, for in one instance, your name and surname might be exposed. And in the second hack, your ID number might be exposed. The third hack, your email address might be exposed. Put that information together and I can recreate your profile for you, which leaves a hotbed for cybercrime activity against you. So when you get that trigger, that email, do the right thing and 
you know, change your password, change your credentials, um, keep abreast of what's happening in and around the industry right now. No, for sure. And it's, of course, uh, don't uh, change your a password to something that uh, perhaps is easily uh, targeted. I do know that the uh, use of uh, numbers and uh, other various uh, characters are often advised when it does uh, come to uh, constructing the password. But as we uh, move towards wrapping up the discussion, I'd like to understand where this industry is headed. Uh, Philippa, in terms of the growth for uh, the uh, cyber uh, insurance space, uh, what does that look like? Where is it likely to come from? Yeah, so um, a lot of industries, 30 to 40 percent of, of all revenue classes and industries are already purchasing cyber insurance of some form. And I'm talking global figures here uh, based on information that one of our global reinsurance partners, Munich Re, have, have assisted us with. Um, and they estimate by the end of this year, there'll be $8 billion of premium income in the insurance space. And that's the, that's the premium to, to help pay for these claims. Um, and that's, that's sort of doubling in the last two years, so two, three years ago, it was four billion. So, so this is expected to take off quite considerably um, as it's a, it's a risk that's not going away and it's an ever evolving risk. So we will need to make sure that we keep developing and evolving the cover as the cyber criminals get more clever in terms of their, their abilities and, and, and what they do. So, so it's definitely on the growth path. Yes, no, certainly, which was going to be uh, one of the uh, points that I raised, just the level of uh, sophistication of these uh, various uh, attacks and uh, the uh, level of uh, innovation that you uh, did allude to. But uh, Alicia, in your point of view, I mean, within this uh, context, uh, perhaps you can share your thoughts on the future of the industry and how the insurance industry in itself is keeping up with these evolving threats. It's definitely an evolving threat, um, Phoebe. What we do and pride ourselves in is partnering with a suite of um, different suppliers and risk managers um, and IT cybersecurity specialists as well, um, because the combination of these partnerships will really help accelerate the growth, not only of the industry, but help us manage and price the risks as well, help us mitigate the risks, um, essentially. And we must be cognizant of, as we all been discussing, the risk is growing. The risk is growing out there, then cyber insurance as well, and the covers that one needs to take also needs to be fit for purpose for these SMEs out there. Mm -hmm. And Adrian, just final thoughts uh, from uh, you, just in terms of small businesses, thinking about this uh, evolving risk uh, management landscape, uh, what would your parting shot uh, to them be as it does pertain to uh, the cyber element and the rising risk of that? So again, increase staff awareness, implement strong password management policies, consult a security uh, specialist, and re reduce the unnecessary transfer of information. And that way, make sure there's no complacency about data management. Get that key to the business with all staff holding data that belongs to third parties, and we can drive this better. All right. Uh, well, uh, nothing further to add there uh, from myself. It does bring us to the end of this uh, conversation. A big thank you to my guests, uh, Philippa Wilde, the head of commercial underwriting at Santam, Alicia Narinsami, the underwriting head, uh, digital distribution at SHA, and Adrian Chester, manager of commercial casualty underwriting at Santam. Until the uh, next conversation, have a great day further. Goodbye. Risk management is at the heart of what we do. Our deep-rooted industry and technical expertise enable us to manage the unique risks your business faces.